part of the importance of the salt, you know, the most traditional means of improving the bioavailability of a compound if you have one that's in the BCS class two or one that's poorly soluble and you think that it might have to be a relatively high dose is uh, salt formation. And so it, this is why traditionally it's, you know, salt versus free forms established very early on and the solubility ratio of one versus the other can be as much as, you know, a salt form can be as much as a thousand uh, times more soluble than uh, say the free or the neutral form of the molecule. And so we try to early on that very first step is determining whether or not you need a salt and determining whether or not you might have to enable it by making an amorphous form to take advantage of the enhanced solubility of the amorphous form over the crystalline form. But then once you've chosen that, you look at polymorphism and, and also, you know, about 30 to 40 percent of the compounds uh, will form a hydrate. And so you almost always have to deal with hydrates or a good percentage of the time you have to deal with a hydrate and where that transition humidity or water activity occurs and determine which one is best for your processing and for control of your product. But um, these are still significant differences, much less so in solubility ratio but a hydrated form versus an anhydrate typically is about, you know, the hydrate's about a quarter the solubility of the anhydrate uh, in water. And one polymorph versus another, this uh, nice paper by Abu Sarajudin from Bristol Myers Squibb uh, in 2005, he took uh, 81 different compounds and compared their solubility ratios to one another and determined that you know, it was a 1.76 on average full difference. The metastable form would be 1.76 more times more soluble than the uh, uh, stable crystalline form. And so those are significant. I mean, if, if you go too far into development and you have to do a, a form change, you're also likely going to have to adjust your dose, which means that your formulator is going to have to change its formulation which means you're costing yourself a fair amount of money. And from my recollection, it was somewhere on the order of at least a half a million dollars to develop a good formulation for a tablet. And so it can get expensive. Um, early studies were typically done drug and capsule or with a very simple formulation. Later studies are done, you know, in the final formulation. So you don't want to have to, to um, develop that final formulation, which costs a lot of money and time. Uh, so it's good to get your polymorph uh, identified and uh, defined very early. Um, the ICH, uh, there was a conference uh, where they har harmonized basically, and there were some Issues actually in the late 80s with carbamazepine hydrate versus anhydrate form where some generic manufacturers came out on the market and uh, had a uh, compound that would convert into a hydrated form and the patients weren't getting efficacious doses from what I recall. And so it really brought the uh, light on the importance of controlling polymorphism. Um, Lilly, uh, the company that I was blessed to work with for 30 years was very, uh, I mean, they were very well aware of this and controlled it. I mean, they had x-ray diffractometers clear back into the 50s. Um, and, uh, but some companies didn't have a full appreciation and it wasn't widely accepted or understood within the pharma industry how important it actually could be. But some of those patients died in, with that carbamazepine and so it heightened the FDA's uh, awareness and so the regulatory guidance came out in the mid-90s, uh, partly because of carbamazepine but it just as being good science. Um, but that, if you look at the guidance, uh, in Q6A on polymorphism is that basically it's a requirement, it's an expectation that you will uh, deliberately search for polymorphs. It's, um, you need to not only 
uh, monitor the batches that you produce and use throughout your development cycle, but you also need to deliberately try to vary the solvents, the compositions, the uh, crystallization conditions in order to find as many forms of your drug as possible and then use good science to establish which form is best for your product. Um, and so that's where, and they also say some of, this is a subset of the common techniques that are used. X-ray powder diffraction's kind of been considered to be the gold standard for identification of solid forms of drugs. Um, differential scanning calorimetry and thermogravimetric analysis is uh, widely employed. Uh, microscopy, a much under appreciated but extremely powerful technique uh, is also one that's used uh, and a variety of uh, molecular spectroscopies are used. Single crystal diffraction is just not used? It is. <laughs> um, it's used, it's um, used with, uh, it's not, not generally does a drug product get produced in a form that's um, of, so the question was, is single crystal diffraction used commonly? In the screening phase, it's not commonly used, uh, probably because of the expense of the technique. And in my lab, because we grew most of the single, we, Discovery Chemistry ultimately gave us, although I kind of worked at the Discovery interface, but they gave us, the because we grew most of the single crystals, we acquired the single crystal diffractometer and did all the structural analysis. And there are some ways, I'm not gonna get into it here, but it's actually quite advantageous because you can calculate your powder diffraction patterns from your single crystal and firmly establish whether or not there's a mixture. So there's actually a really nice interplay between single crystal and powder diffraction, but it's generally not um, the final product uh, and the a APIs are generally of smaller particle size. So it's not used as a traditional method for distinguishing polymorphs for the screening part. So is this a polymorphic screening be part of MDA's submission or is it required? Uh, yeah, it's actually a requirement. So yes, the um, polymorph screening is an expectation and is a part of your regulatory document. You have to explain what all you've done and basically convince the FDA that you've done good science and, and it ultimately factors into the uh, control of your product, your API, as well as your product. And so they look for that in your regulatory submission. And hopefully when they see a ro robust package and rationale, they understand that you have good control of your process and product. Um, and so uh, ultimately, and you can, Actually, um, I think there's supposed to be two identification techniques. If you, ideally, you'll produce out of your API, once you've identified the forms and understand their thermodynamic relationships, you can get a process that'll produce a single form. And then you'll have a, use a qualitative technique, oftentimes X-ray powder diffraction. You can substitute, I think usually you have to have two uh, analytical methods for identification of your API and you can substitute you know, X-ray powder diffraction is one of those. Alternatively, it can be FTIR, which is a little less uh, discerning from uh, uh, a crystallographic standpoint, but uh, uh, powder diffraction works very well for this. And so you can, I, ideally you have a single form present uh, and it stays that single form. And if you have multiple forms, you might have it where, you know, you look for these peaks that prove that you have the right form and then you ensure at this position and this position and this position that this other form that's known to potentially come out of your process or that's relevant to your process isn't present. And so it's just a qualitative method where um, you just uh, identify the single polymorphic form. Uh, but there are other special occasions where you might actually have a quantitative method developed. And I've done that on a few processes for specific reasons, and I'm not gonna get into them here, but you're, you know, generally you try to get into a, 
uh, where you have a qualitative method for identification of the form of the final product API and what's present in your, which the next slide goes to that though, um, is that you monitor during your uh, stability, your accelerated stability testing to ensure that there's no interconversions of forms and make sure that the form stays the same. Uh, if it doesn't, you'll end up having an acceptance criteria which um, will set specifications or limits as to how much uh, is acceptable of a extraneous or different polymorphic form, but you'll put in your analytical tests, which um, high percentage of the time it'll be IR or Raman. Uh, most often though, IR or X-ray powder diffraction to control your product. 